Yes, so thank you. So my paper is titled uh, Diverse Movement in a Dynamic Environment. And I'm going to be talking about uh, modeling uh, local transport movements uh, in the Dutch part of the Roman Limes. Um, well, first I want to briefly reflect on, on what's usually done uh, in archaeology when we're talking about transport, or especially uh, during the Roman time period. Uh, most archaeologists are interested in transport that's occurring on, on very large scale. So we have, of course, examples from shipping on the Mediterranean. We have uh, examples of uh, studies on the, the Roman roads network, which, of, of course, we have very, very valuable and very good sources for, such as the Peutingen table shown here. And it's reflected in, in some modern uh, computational studies, such as the excellent work uh, in the Orbis, the uh, Stanford Geospatial Network model of the Roman world that looked exactly like a Google Maps. And you can say you're in Nijmegen and you want to go to Rome and you can take either a horse or a boat and decide which is the best way to go there. Um, so it, it works very well. Um, and this is also reflected, of course, in the archaeological record. For instance, in the Netherlands, we uh, have evidence for shipping on the, the Rhine and the Meuse rivers. And of course, we have evidence for this same military road that ran al along the Rhine and connected to all the military fortresses. Um, but when we're talking about, uh, in our project, uh, our, interest is, uh, our interest in the uh, relationships between the local population and the military population, um, we're talking about local skill uh, transport uh, and a local skill transport that leaves very little material traces um, uh, in the form of constructed roads, for instance, where it was more likely that uh, they traveled along routes that had leave no physical evidence. Um, so the research aims are really to quantify the factors then that influence transportation and look at the interplay of transport with the natural environment and that's where really the, the modeling of these uh, transport routes uh, come in. Uh, and we want to do this in order uh, uh, to reconstruct and analyze transport networks and then to use these to uh, an uh, analyze the interaction between local population and the military population. Um, now, in order to reconstruct transport, uh, uh, local transport routes for modeling, we need to know a lot about paleogeography. Because obviously, when you're in the train uh, in the Netherlands on your way here to Amsterdam and you look out the window, you see that a lot of it is likely not as it was in the Roman period. Uh, the landscape has changed uh, considerably, and we need to know what it looked like. Now, a good deal of uh, that research has already been done uh, uh, earlier in an excellent project by Utrecht University, by Marieke van Dinter, who reconstructed the landscape of the Old Rhine, so in the western part of the Netherlands. Uh, and we've aimed to uh, extend that work uh, by covering the entirety of the Dutch Limes, uh, so from the German border up until the coast. And I'll also briefly uh, go over the methodology, and it just involves the manual uh, combination of, of uh, various data sets. So we have uh, geomorphological maps, we have uh, soil maps, uh, we have uh, elevation data. You might think, why do we need elevation data? Because the Netherlands is flat, uh, which is uh, mostly true, but the elevation data shows a lot of information about uh, paleo landscape in the form of the, the, the levees of uh, current rivers, but mostly also the abandoned rivers uh, due to differential subsidence. So it shows a lot, a lot of information about the paleo landscape as well. Uh, and then we have information on uh, the, the, the evolution and evolution of channel belts so that we know which rivers were active during the Roman period and which rivers were abandoned, which river belts were abandoned uh, prior to the Roman period, which is of course very valuable information also from research by Utrecht University. Um, and then we have various uh, uh, smaller data sets, of course, such as archaeological uh, uh, excavations. Uh, and the combination of this data set results in this paleogeographic map. Um, now, uh, I'll just go briefly uh, over the various uh, areas that we have. We have these, these, these areas represented by the grasses here. They are the peatlands. And then we have in the center here, the light grayish colors are, are the clay flood basin. And then we have sandy areas in the east over here. 
um, and they are interspersed by some very, my, very, very tiny belts uh, running from east to west, which are the river belts uh, 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 with the levees. And these levees are actually the rela re uh, relatively higher and drier places where people would have lived, where people would have performed agriculture, and also most likely where people would have moved because they are drier, uh, uh, higher and drier places in the landscape as opposed to the, the low and wet flood basins and peat, uh, peat, uh, peatlands. Uh, now, the way archae uh, in archaeology uh, that transport is often reconstructed is through least cost path modeling. And of course, the concept is quite simple. There's an arbitrary cost unit and people try to uh, minimize that cost while going from A to B. Um, now, as a cost unit, I've, I've uh, taken time and I've used this cost equation specifically for uh, reconstructing walking as a, a mode of transportation. Uh, because it allows me to uh, include as well a, a carried load, which is the L in this formula, uh, which represents uh, uh, something that's being carried, for, for instance, a bushel of grain. Uh, but it also includes a train coefficient, which is very useful, uh, because it allows me to actually include the uh, paleogeographic, paleogeographic units uh, that I have in my map, because uh, most uh, studies that use least cost path modeling uh, use uh, uh, derivatives of elevation, so slope. Uh, uh, so they use slope as a, a cost unit, but of course in the Netherlands this is not really relevant. So we have to really be able to use the paleogeographic paleo information that's available. Now we don't have to uh, come up with numbers uh, ourselves for the paleographic map uh, because that research is already uh, has also already been done. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one conversion uh, because uh, uh, the original data relates more to uh, vegetation and hydrology, whereas the paleogeography is more morphology and hydrology. Um, but I've uh, tried to, uh, uh, as best as I could, uh, make, the, um, make the conversion, uh, and it sort of works like this. Uh, in the left, on the left hand, you have a graph that represents uh, velocity versus carried load. So obviously, when you carry more, your velocity decreases in general. Uh, in the right hand uh, graph uh, is velocity versus uh, the terrain coefficient. So obviously, when you tra traverse a, a more difficult terrain, uh, you will travel more slowly. Um, now, if we model, we can model various uh, connections between places, um, uh, and this is shown here in this map, uh, where the straight lines are simplified representations of the least cost paths. So the least cost paths, of course, are not necessarily straight because they try to uh, minimize the costs of getting uh, from A to B. Um, and this shows the walking while not carrying a load. So you can see that's a, a, a rather densely connected network. Uh, because just regular walking while not carrying anything is a relatively easy mode of uh, going about. Now this is walking while carrying a very heavy load of 40 kilograms, which is sort of taken as the upper limit and you can take uh, values in between as well. Uh, but at this upper limit you can see there are only very few connections left. Um, and this is of course because it's a very difficult mode of transportation. Um, uh, and of course, there are also different modes of transportation uh, available. So we can think of mule cart transport, for instance, and ox cart transport. Um, mule cart transport and ox cart transport are a bit more difficult to model because we can't directly use, of course, the cost equation that we have for walking, and they're, they're not as well studied. So we have to rely on a literary, a literary evidence that we have, for instance, from both Roman authors and from more modern authors that talk about uh, a certain distance that mule carts or ox carts can travel uh, in a day. And then we have some more modern information as well on how animal-drawn carts behave on certain types of terrain. Uh, so we have friction information on that. Uh, and then we can sort of tweak around with the cost values that we have uh, to come up with a new cost map. Uh, this is the result for uh, mule car transport, where you model tra uh, movements like that. Is it quite densely connected again, and this is because mule carts uh, are a relatively fast mode of transportation still, but they, they try to uh, uh, avoid uh, the lower lying areas uh, much more than regular walking, of course, because you uh, would rather not uh, have your carts uh, get stuck in, uh, in, in wetlands. Uh, ox carts, on the other hand, are uh, relatively slow modes of, of transportation, so again you see a very uh, loosely connected, very few connections as well uh, in this network. 
So you can see that uh, the, the modes of transportation that are available to, to someone would change a lot how the network uh, would materialize in the end. Now, there's one other mode of transportation as well, which is water-based transportation. And there's one difference uh, in that uh, water-based transportation is directional, so it matters whether you're moving in a downstream or an upstream direction. Um, uh, and another thing is that water-based transportation is often part of multimodal transportation because it's only very rarely that you're going from uh, one place on the water to another place on the water. Often you have to go there and you have to get away from there again. It works the same way with train stations and airports, for instance. Um, so we uh, can combine multi We can combine water-based transport with land-based transportation modes. Uh, for instance, this one for walking without carrying a load with optional boat transport. And then uh, if you can see the white lines are the ones that were already there and the yellow ones are the ones that are added by boat transportation or that replace boat transportation by being a faster method. And you can see that uh, it doesn't really change a lot, um, at least for this particular region, which is the central part of the case study area. Um, now this makes sense because we're talking about a local uh, skilled transport network. And in this part of the region, uh, when we're talking about the local skilled transport, especially when we're thinking about movement uh, between the local population and the military population, it's mostly movement from south to north, in general speaking terms, rather than movement from east to west, which is the general direction of the rivers in this area. It's only in the western part of the Netherlands, there's probably a different story because there are more north-south directed uh, streams that uh, uh, could uh, be traveled upon. Uh, but in this case, uh, it doesn't really add uh, that much. Uh, now, these are the actual uh, transport routes, so no, mo no longer the simplified uh, representations. And I'm showing this particular case study because there are a number of uh, oddities in there. Um, especially when we're looking at the center, we see a number of uh, routes that uh, are crossing the river, so the big uh, white line, they're crossing the river twice. Um, and that's a very arbitrary thing to do, of course. Why would you, why would you do that? And the reason that the paths are doing that is uh, because of the paleogeographic paleo reconstruction. It's because there is no levee on the southern side of the river that uh, is uh, profitable uh, to travel upon. So they would rather cross the river twice than go over the floodplain over there. Now, I'm not saying there, there is no levee there. It's just on the scale of the reconstruction, there is no levee there. Uh, but it, let's assume uh, as an exercise that's an error in the, in the reconstruction and we correct that by adding the, uh, adding the levee on the southern side of the river and see what happens, uh, how that changes uh, the modeled route. And it changes the modeled route considerably because now all of a sudden only one route, which is the northernmost one, would rather cross the river twice than go all the way around. And all other routes would rather go around. So it really changes the network changes uh, the modeled routes a lot. Now, the question is, uh, does that really matter ultimately? Um, and the answer is maybe it doesn't, because now we're still uh, only modeling the uh, potential routes of movement. Uh, but when we're actually going to move forward to uh, constructing networks of, of transport, uh, connecting the local population with the military population, we have to make a selection of these transport routes. Um, and the, whether or not these, these uh, unlikely routes to be traveled uh, are included in those transport networks is really dependent on the choices that you make in a network construction. Uh, and network construction is really the topic of uh, the second paper that I'm going to present, and that paper is going to be uh, at half past two in the afternoon, where I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, actually, uh, so actually constructing the transport networks and applying network analysis. Um, and with that, I would like to conclude uh, the first half of my uh, research presentation. Thank you.